Hi, I'm Mike Nixon. Welcome to Common Sense. This program is dedicated to the proposition that most of what you know is probably wrong, and this program is intended to correct some of those uh, incorrect ideas. Uh, one of those areas where there's a lot of information is the whole area of hemp. It's known by other names, which we may mention today. But, um, four years ago, we did a series of programs on hemp we called the miracle plant, because it truly is a miracle plant. And one of the guests we had on at that time was a gentleman by the name of Sean House, who was in the hemp business. And we have Sean back today to uh, bring us up to date, tell us a little bit about uh, what he's doing and what his business is about. So, Sean, welcome back to Common Sense. It's great to be back, Mike. Thanks for having me. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, what your business is about and, um, you know, what this hemp industry is as far as your role in it. Well, I've had... Uh, quite an interest in hemp after being involved in antiques and collectibles and learning the history of hemp in Pennsylvania that we weren't taught in school. I had an inclination to go that way since it was working with agriculture previous to my other businesses in computers and, and um, portrait photography. So my company has been developing pretzels using hemp seed, hemp flour, and hemp oil and we have a brand called Hempsels, and that's where we were tying hemp and pretzels together, and so it was called Hempsels. And so being involved in the industry for quite a, a few years, and since I've last been here, we've taken it a little further on what we've been producing. Uh, we started out producing sourdough pretzels, contracting with a local company in Hanover, Pennsylvania, and they've been baking our, our sourdough Hempsels for now about six or seven years. And recently, we've been producing peanut butter-filled hemp pretzel nuggets, uh, machine-extruded pretzel uh, made by one of the largest pretzel companies in the United States with our formulation and our, our branding. And so what we're doing is providing uh, the consumer with a value-added product, and that is snack foods incorporating hemp seed, hemp flour, and hemp oil. Uh, the seed is a very nutritious source of protein comparable to beef and eggs, uh, omega-3s, which is a key buzzword now for essential fatty acids, which folks get through their diet through fish, and here we can get it through a plant-based source. And it's also a source of dietary fiber and also vitamin E. Um, so we're packaging these products in Pennsylvania or having them baked in Pennsylvania, and we're bringing all these raw materials in from Canada. So since I've been here last, I've had a couple more trips up to Canada to meet with the Ontario Hemp Alliance and the folks that are producing the hemp. Hemp's been uh, still grown in 31 industrial nations, and the United States is one of the largest importers of hemp. So we've been active politically. The Pennsylvania Farm Bureau members had voted in 2000. This is, we had discussed this before. I think it was 2001 to uh, grow, process, sell, manufacture industrial hemp. We kind of thought our job had been done at that time, but we were not growing hemp in Pennsylvania, so there's still a lot of work to do. And at that time, didn't the uh, Department of Agriculture, was in, the PA Department of Agriculture was involved with uh, that process, right? They yeah. eventually jumped in and... Uh... Well, the, the farmers voted for this. It didn't go anywhere past our state uh, Farm Bureau meeting. It didn't go to the national mm -hmm. level, but many states, I think approximately 11 states, have resolutions through to study, grow, or uh, study hemp and see the potential that it has. We have to remember nowadays, and it's a little bit more relevant now that we're at war, that anything you can make from petroleum, you can make from the farmer's fields. And hemp is an ideal candidate as a 90-day crop growing anywhere from 8 to 18 feet tall. Uh, popular mechanics called it the new billion-dollar crop in 1937. Uh, that's when a dollar was worth a dollar. And anything from textiles to dynamite to plastics to fuel to foods uh, can be made from this plant, something that the farmers can grow and regrow. It's an excellent rotation crop. Right. Relative to the whole petroleum thing, I read the other day Brazil is now self-sufficient with regard to, uh, I mean, they're not using hemp, unfortunately, but uh, uh, I guess they're using corn uh, sure. uh, to make ethanol, and they're totally self-sufficient. And uh, one of the things we talked about in that program years ago, if we have the capacity to grow this rapidly, I mean, you could do how many How many times could you grow uh, um, a stand of hemp in, in a season? 
Well, probably once or twice. It's basically yeah. planned at the same time tobacco is and harvested sometime in August. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily a farmer. I'm more of a marketer right, and right. developer of products. Right. But but uh, it would be possible to, uh, if we followed uh, Brazil's lead and used hemp as the basis, we could eliminate our... Uh, our dependence on foreign oil. Sure, and, and we showed that in uh, three months before we were attacked on September 11th of 2001 by hosting and introducing HempCar, which the viewer can see at hempcar.org on the website, and see that this Mercedes-Benz that had been converted to run on hemp biodiesel fuel ran 13,000 miles and came up to Hempfield Township here in Lancaster and we were up by Three Mile Island, and then they went up to New York and throughout. And we can just look across the border and see what our Canadian friends and farmers are doing and how they're selling their fiber to Detroit that's putting it in their cars. And later on, we'll see a clip of the Dodge Stratas, the BMWs having hemp and flax in their car panels. It's an excellent fiberglass substitute. There's a lot of potential. Mine as a company, we're incorporated as of March 2005, to develop hemp foods and other hemp products. So our company goal is to contract with our Pennsylvania farmers. It's always been a case of the cart before the horse. So if the farmers were able to grow hemp, what would we do with it then? The Canadians had always said, just as a rotation crop, hemp, uh, everything that grew after hemp grew taller, except for wheat. So just as a rotation crop for eliminating um, cyst nematoids, which attack soy, and other um, types of destructive um, pest. Hemp is another, just as a great rotation crop. But here, we're working with Pennsylvania manufacturers, so we ultimately want to contract with our Pennsylvania farmers so we can have a secure source of raw materials here and do exactly what the Canadians are doing and the other, the Germans and the British and the French and the Russians and so on, and Brazil. Uh, hemp even has a higher burning rate. It's 10 times higher burning rate than corn. You know, and it was interesting because I was flipping through the radio stations and I, I came upon an interview with a politician, didn't know his name at the time, and he was talking about hemp biodiesel fuel. And we see that that's where the political shift is happening. The consumers were demanding it. When we did it three months before 911, we were laughed at. It was kind of a joke. And that's normal, normal. That's normal how it is with profits. You go in there and say, look, we should be using renewable energy. And they're like, ha, 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 you know, gas is much cheaper. But we're in the newspaper saying, look, we don't want to be held uh, dependent on foreign sources of oil. And here we can get it from our farmers. And um, what I was getting at with the, um, the biodiesel car is even Mercedes-Benz, when, when uh, Rudolph uh, diesel invented the diesel engine in 1892 it was built specifically to run on vegetable and seed oil really so here again we have a quicker way of getting ourselves off that oil addiction as our president bush had uh, talked about and we've been emphasizing this for the last six years but there's still been a lot of educational hurdles and even battles with agencies within the federal government who have been trying to ban hemp and hemp foods. Right, right. Um, do we want to take a look at that that clip now? You were talking about... Uh, um, well, is there time now, or should we talk about the what we went through with the DEA in regards to hemp foods? Because as of September 24th, 2005, the, that was the last date that the DEA had to appeal Mm -hmm. Two rulings against it by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals where the DEA had been trying to almost outlaw hemp foods by putting ambiguous language in our federal registry. And this is a way of circumventing what Congress is meant to do in making laws and studying. It's similar to what that would happen to the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act where they called cannabis, hemp, marijuana, without any type of overview and in essence creating a tax but in essence outlawed what we were what the farmers had been doing since the founding of the country right because industrial hemp doesn't have the same medicinal medicinal if you will properties that uh, that uh, cannabis would conventional 
cannabis has, right? Right, right. And like we we like to tell people, the person that's not familiar. I, I always like the analogy. It's like you know, uh, the corn you feed to cattle is corn, but it's not something a human being would want to eat. Well, and, and we like because it's a different strain. It has different properties, different qualities, which, sure. are, fine, which are fine for that that process. Sure, it's, it's not something edible to uh, to human beings. Right, and and even taking that example further, so the consumer can understand. It's like taking your oranges and your lemons and your grapefruit, okay? Now, you can squeeze an orange, but you're not going to get lemonade or grape ju grapefruit. You can squeeze a lemon and vice versa. The common similarity is that they're from the citrus family. We could also do f this for farmers in the sense of equines, palominos, and donkeys. Or not equines, I apologize, but palominos, donkeys, uh, quarter horses. They're all from the equine family. So with cannabis sativa, there are 700 varieties of this plant. You have one aspect on the far side that is a medicinal or recreational use of cannabis. Things that they're fighting it for in Nevada, California, for glaucoma, AIDS, wasting, uh, a myriad of effects. I mean, it's one of the oldest pharmacopoeia uh, drugs, if you'd say drugs, that's been used for centuries. But mm -hmm. we're focusing on the commercial industrial aspect of hemp. This is where it's 300 plants per meter grown for the stalk that would be put into building blocks that will show, or the seed that would run cars or food, uh, feed feed mankind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you, want, you may as well, you brought up the DEA uh, thing. Why don't you talk about the status of that now? Sure. As of September 25th, that was the last day of 2005 that the DEA could appeal because they had been ruled against twice that uh, what they were doing was wrong and they had no legal leg to stand on this. And what they were doing was essentially saying if it has any trace amount of THC, THC, it is therefore marijuana and therefore it's illegal. Right, right. And here we follow the Canadian protocol, which is 10 parts per millionth, which is like comparing an olive pit in a railroad car full of product. That there's more uh, alcohol and fruit juices, more opiates and poppy seed bagels than there is THC in any hemp food products that you can eat. Right. Um, so, right, that, that we stopped the DEA. I was part of the suit. I wasn't financing it because it's been quite a struggle uh, for the past four years to get the consumers to understand this and get the federal government to back down, and they have. Hemp is perfectly legal. They can get our products at any local health food stores. Uh, we're going to get into wild oats nationwide here relatively soon, and we're now a PA preferred company, so we're recognized by the Department of Agriculture through the marketing aspect of what we're doing. So again, uh, producing healthier foods incorporating hemp seed, hemp flour, and hemp oil with the ultimate goal of contracting with farmers so we can produce fiberglass substitutes with hemp, building materials, we can do our dehulling and processing right here, and even do our own hemp biodiesel fuel. Right, which would give work to people in Pennsylvania and lower your costs. And help the farmers and right. save farmlands without creating laws prohibiting farmers from, from selling their farms. Right. It would give fo folks an opportunity, and that's what the farmers need. They need opportunities. They don't need to be dictated to. Uh, the consumers are already making their choices. And the way the cars are going, we'll go into that video, um, coming up to, uh, going up to Canada recently, they are supplying Detroit with the fiber that is going into the Dodge Strata and the Chrysler Sebrings, just like they're doing in Germany with the BMWs. And that's what we'll show the viewer is how they're harvesting hemp. That's what the viewer is going to watch. Hemp is being cut down with uh, large combines and processed where it's 50% hemp and 50% flax. And the viewer is going to see a car part made. And if they look at their Dodge Strat or Chrysler Sebrains, they're going to have that. And we've been told through Ford that within the next six years, the outside of the cars are going to be the same way. Hmm. Okay, well, let's uh, take a quick... Um, look at this clip and we'll be right back.
Okay, um, well, that was, uh, uh, we saw a kata from taking it off the field to the uh, plastic in the, uh, in the vehicle. Right, so the Germans and the Europeans have been far ahead of the Americans in the sense of recycling. Everything that they manufacture in Germany can be traced right from the beginning to the end because that is really a big issue and we see again the consumer and a paradigm shift is becoming more aware of our, our carbon footprint, as we like to say, and, and what we're consuming. So again, our goal is to start reviving this hemp industry, and we're gonna tell the viewers how they can do that through political action, but to see what's being done, and to see that these new cars, these BMW cars, are getting lighter, but they're using hemp fiber, it's stronger. Mm -hmm. Excellent fiberglass substitute without that use of glass and without that issue of uh, things floating through the air. I mean, it's just healthier for the environment. Um, I see you got a couple props along. Sure, sure. Uh, why don't we talk about some of the things you got here? Carl, you may want to pull back on uh, uh, Sean a little bit so we have a little wider shot here. Well, on top, we have our peanut butter filled hemp pretzel nuggets. Let's Pick it up and There's a picture of the Canadian hemp fields here. Uh, these are machine extruded. We also put the photograph of the Hanover, Pennsylvania hemp farmer on the back. And we talk about all the names for hemp. In mm. French, they call it chanvre. In Japanese, they call it aza. The Germans call it humph. In Espanol, it's called canyamo. So this is universal, and we're trying to put that into our packaging. Um, with the food products, we're also packaging now the organic whole toasted hemp seed. And this addresses for the consumer the issue of carbs or wheat intolerance or gluten intolerance, where they're looking for protein, vitamins, and minerals. And here they can get it right from the seed. Get a good, right. So this is that. something that they can... Maybe I'll it, just uh, get a closer shot later. And sure. Put it in. That's good. That's good, Carl. Comparable to flax, and a lot more ladies are, are understanding the benefits of flax. Doctors have been prescribing flax for dry skin, dry hair, PMS, a lot of different issues, even for protein for vegetarians that aren't eating meat but need a protein source. The protein per two ounces of seed is almost 13 grams. That's also 72 per two ounces. 13 grams for two ounces of seed. For two seed. ounces of seed, and it's 72% wow. vitamin E. So if so, you're on a low-carb diet, that's uh, definitely absolutely. the thing to a have. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you don't have the wheat and those type of issues. So that's where we're packaging the seed. Below, I was just up in Canada uh, March of this year to meet with the Ontario Hemp Alliance. Now, the Ontario Hemp Alliance is a group of farmers that's been growing hemp for the last five years. I've been up there a few years, and we'll probably show a couple pictures of us next to the hemp fields there. But the block I received is from a home where they're using hemp fiber, chopping up the stalk and putting it into the, the bricks. Right, yeah, pick it up. In, in France, this is called iso mm -hmm. It's very strong and it's very light. Right. And so uh, this is just the one that could be painted. They're showing the rough side mm -hmm. and showing the smooth side that would be painted. I was saying before the show, that's lighter than a brick of, say, uh, white pine. Okay. If, you know, if, if you 
if you, you work with wood, it's, it's significantly lighter than that. So it's, I mean, obviously it's not as a concrete brick like that would be hard, very almost, heavy. I, I wouldn't hold, hold it, it that like easy. That, right? yeah, yeah. So it, it's uh, very light. Right. And very strong though. I mean, you could probably hit that with a hammer and uh, it wouldn't chip much. Right. Pest resistant also, but this is what the, the Canadians are doing. And again, we have uh, our peers throughout the world to look at what they're, how they're incorporating hemp. And going back to what we we're saying before, we're interested in the seed, flour, and oil for our food production here in Pennsylvania. But with the, the stalk, that's where we could grind it up and put it into building materials, uh, such as the brick that we just saw uh, as a fiberglass substitute, put it in for paper production and such. Uh, the Ontario Hemp Alliance in, uh, meets annually, and they have a farm day, and it's going to be the end of August. And it's about 400 miles from here. It's about a 10-hour trip from York, Pennsylvania. But folks could go to the OntarioHempAlliance.org website and see the directions and what they're going to be doing. They'll have our hemp foods up there, and they'll have a hemp maze. That's OntarioHempAlliance.org. Ontario Alliance. We'll put that up on the screen. And again, these are the same farmers that we contract with and that are growing hemp that will grow in New York and in Pennsylvania. So a lot of our work will already be done through these dedicated farmers. And it, it's really enjoyable, and I highly recommend uh, legislators or the political, the environmentalists or the, the people that are always questioning why we're promoting hemp to go up there and see this magnificent plant. Yeah, we, we showed pictures on that show years ago. We had a cornfield on one side of the path and, and a hemp field on on the other. Right. And Dan Scheel, whose farm they're having the meeting at uh, in August, uh, this is his third or fourth year that he's growing it. And this year they're growing it just for seed to replant farmers' fields. So it's been really interesting. And again, talking to the, the people that are supplying the fiber that's going to Detroit, it's unbelievable when Ford tells them that the outside of these cars are going to be made with a combination of flax and hemp. They may still want to run it on gas, but it's going to be lighter than steel and it's going to be as strong. Really? Yeah. Is it going to be, a, is it a plastic sort of, like that, they use in Saturn? Just you know? like they're doing now, yeah. exactly. And that's what they're going to be, because it's more recyclable. Just like we were referring to the Germans earlier about knowing from the beginning the product life cycle mm -hmm. on where it's going to wind up. They don't want to wind up in landfills. Right. You know, and the consumers are voting with their dollars. And we see now that hemp bio, or biodiesel fuel, at least, is becoming more uh, prevalent. And as I'd mentioned before, here turning through the radio, listening to a local politician, Gib Armstrong, telling the, the uh, WDAC uh, moderator that we have biodiesel fuel and we can make it, and here he says, from millions of acres of trees. Hmm. And I'm like, good Lord, here we can be doing this in 90 days from the farmer's fields without tearing down ecosystems and cutting down trees where you have all types of other yeah, living a, things. An acre of hemp produces a lot more fiber than uh, or. I guess seed in this case, right? Well, seed in, in over the course of 20 years, more fiber than tree, right. tree pulp. Right. And again, you don't have to use bleaching agents like they're doing down at Gladfelder's Mill when they could be using fiber. Mm -hmm. And it's not just hemp. It's other fiber composts such as straw and things of that nature. But hemp has to be one of those alternatives uh, for the farmers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Anything else going on with products, uh, new products? Well, what we're looking at is taking that organic seed, blending this up to make it into a nut butter that doesn't have peanuts in it. It tastes wonderful. Eating the seed is like eating sunflower seed, the shell and all. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at blending this up within the next three or four months and making it into a hemp nut butter something great with jelly. And I grew up on mm. peanut butter and jelly mm -hmm. sandwiches. And I'm telling you, it's hands down much better than peanut butter and much healthier, especially with folks with allergies. So those are a few of the products. And we're looking at doing more machine extruded pretzels so we have greater quality control and we can handle the capacity to supply the United States. 
And uh, we are joining the food co-op through the Pennsylvania Preferred Program and getting involved. And we'll be exporting foods produced from Pennsylvania from imported seed from Canada, ultimately wanting to bring it in here from our regional farmers. Right. right. So that's some of the new products. Uh, in the sense of activism, people are like, we love what you're doing. What can we do? And it's always been a federal issue. Well, we've got a, a great Republican uh, congressman down in Texas. That's Ron Paul. And he's also a doctor. And he studied this issue about hemp to find out what's been keeping our farmers from growing hemp. This 1937 Marijuana Tax Act that we've discussed in previous programs was meant to tax quote-unquote mar marijuana, which I don't even like to use that word since it's racist in origin, right. medicinal cannabis. Well, in 1970, that act was declared unconstitutional. Okay, But the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 through Ronald Reagan lumped hemp and cannabis, or a.k.a. marijuana, together. As a Schedule 1? As a, a Schedule 1 or Schedule 2, yeah. which is crazy. But this is like, again, banning all grapefruit, lemons, and oranges, donkeys, palominos, and quarter horses, just because one equine wasn't fully understood. Right. Or puppies and or chihuahuas and German shepherds and Doberman pinchers. You know, something crazy. So H.R. 3037 is really simple. People can go to votehemp.com. Uh, or they can go to Hempsel's website. If you type in pretzels on Google, we're in the top three or four, and we have a little form there where people can view H.R. 3037. And basically what doc Dr. Ron Paul, Congressman Ron Paul says, is hemp is not marijuana. And what that will do is pull that from the Controlled Substance Act and bring it right back to the Department of Agriculture for the various states regulated as an agriculture uh, issue, as it always had been. Mm -hmm. Because prior to the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, you could find hemp farming in any U.S. Department of Agriculture yearbook. And this is what we show to explain to the farmer that this is not a new crop. This is an old crop. And as we like to say, when God or our Creator makes a plant or a seed, it's it's made for a use. It's basically man's prohibition prohibitionist mentality that keeps us from really living a healthier, more sustainable um, lifestyle. Right. So we're going to be at the York Fair coming up here. Well, let's hold that till the uh, sure. second part of the show because sure. uh, um, I think maybe this would be a good time to take a break. Uh, we'll go watch a few PSAs and um, we'll come back and talk to uh, Sean a little bit more about uh, uh, what some of the things he has planned in the next few weeks. So we'll be back in just a moment. Excuse me, you seem like nice folks. Uh -huh. Do you believe in gun control? Yes. Then would you be willing to stand behind what you believe and post this sign in your front yard? Think gun control's a good idea? Think again. Call now or visit AmericanLibertyFoundation.org. Okay, maybe a little of the money I spend on marijuana supports terror and violence. Right. And uh, that's because marijuana is illegal. Exactly. When I buy a beer, that doesn't support terror because beer is legal, right? Now you've got it. So what you're saying is if we make marijuana legal and regulate it like beer, that wouldn't support violence. Did I say that? There are over 20,000 gun laws in America today. Mommy. The problem is... Money? Criminals don't obey the law. Gun control only disarms the innocent. Call now or visit AmericanLibertyFoundation.org. Hi, I'm Mike Nixon. Welcome back to Common Sense. If you're just joining us, uh, we're with Sean House. We're talking about hemp. Uh, and his hemp uh, business and the, the hemp, the budding hemp industry in Pennsylvania and, and in uh, the United States. 
Um, at the end of the last segment, we talked about some of the things that you're uh, involved in coming up. Uh, tell me some of the things you've been doing lately. I mean, you've been getting all around the state. Well, we've been traveling and speaking to different groups that I think are really going to be interested in the hemp industry. And part of that's been the culinary aspect. Again, my company is producing hemp pretzels and hemp baklava and hemp mustard and hemp seed and, and uh, different hemp foods. So what I'm hoping to do and, and through speaking with these different groups is inspire the, the new Martha Stewart's, the Wolfgang Puck's, the Rachel Ray's in the culinary industry. Uh, this is helping to create our customers so they're more familiar with serving our hemp soft pretzels because they're familiar with the nutritional aspects. So I've traveled to Philadelphia. I was down at the restaurant school a couple months ago, spoke to the culinary instructor or the culinary uh, students there as well as instructors. Uh, recently, I've been at York Technical Institute at the Lancaster County branch uh, talking to the culinary students there. Again, talking about the historical significance of hemp, why there's Hempfield Township right next to the, in the area that they're going to school. And it's got all the Stowns people. Oh, it, it does. Okay. It does. And we have to bring that back because, again, our educational system just doesn't talk about that. You know, we bring up the quotes from Ben Franklin talking about the hemp for Conestoga and, and where the wagons came from, but really stressing the aspect of the seed for nutrition because we see people more concerned about their health and they're concerned about essential fatty acids and the lack of that in our diets. Uh, due to the fact that we're eating so many processed foods, we're not giving the body the actual nutrients that it needs to sustain good health. And a big part of, of our attention deficit disorder issues and our uh, lack of energy is through the lack of essential fatty acids. Again, something that you get through fish or you get it through plant-based sources such as flax, primrose, borage oils. And then one of the issues with getting those nutrients is we've been polluting our, our rivers and our ocean ways, so we're actually toxifying our fish, mercury levels and things of that nature. Uh, I subscribe, and many do, that it's best to get it from a plant-based source, naturally organic, or as organic as it can be. And here again, with the hemp seed, you have a source of protein, essential fatty acids, specifically omega-3, uh, uh, vitamin E, vitamin uh, C, calcium, um, things of that nature. So talking to those culinary students, we are helping them because they're going to be the decision makers five years from now when they're running their own restaurants. Uh, we've had two successful events at the Pennsylvania Farm Show, and there part of it is showing historical significance hemp has, has played, and the timeline from 8,000 B.C. all the way to 2006 showing the, the cover-up with hemp and the, the racist issue of the marijuana and calling it marijuana and the laws. And their folks have been able to sample the pretzels, they've been able to purchase our products and get more educated because we like to just say no, but not the Nancy Reagan N-O, but K-N-O-W for knowledge. Right. We have a great tape called Hemp for Victory that the government produced in 1942, specifically the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and we'll be showing that tape soon, but that's what we've done at the Pennsylvania Farm Show. We hope to duplicate that uh, coming up soon for the York County Fair. We'll be set up in Political Alley. Uh, people can come down and also see the history, see the blocks, um, see the uh, products and sample our hemp hempsels, and uh, they can see that on our website at hempsels.com. Or again, if they type in pretzels on Google, we're right in the top three and under our event listing. They can also see the historical timeline that we've put together, uh, highlighting what's been happening in Pennsylvania in the 1700s as well as in 2006. So the videotape that we're going to be watching soon is called Hemp for Victory. Uh, this was found in the uh, Congressional Library. It was produced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And its significance today is that this film was produced at a time of war, and that was World War II, where the Japanese had cut off the manila supply of hemp. And hemp was still a strategic commodity back then, as it is now. 
And so the U.S. Department of Agriculture produced this film extolling the virtues of hemp, referring to the historical significance of hemp, and encouraging the farmers to grow hemp for the war effort. And they grew thousands of acres. Some of the farmers were actually forced to grow hemp. Um, but it was interesting because here we take this plant that's been demonized and then extol the virtues of it. And then after World War II, they cut off the tax act or the, the permission that they were giving farmers to grow hemp. And they actually stopped growing hemp uh, in full capacity in the 1950s. They were still growing it in Chicago uh, up until the 1950s. And again, that 1970, the Controlled Substance Act lumped hemp and medicinal cannabis, as I call it, but they always referred to it as marijuana altogether. So it's a really interesting tape. And notice the Conestoga wagons in this tape. As you see this, these were things that were produced in Conestoga, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. you know, as they went out west. Uh, so did the spreading of hemp farming grow out west. So it's really interesting. Parachute rigging and even webbing that uh, saved George Bush Sr., who had, um, when his plane went down, was using a parachute that was made with hemp rigging. So really, really interesting. And, and now that we're in war again and we're fighting over oil, uh, I think you'd call this a, a carbohydrate or a hydrocarbon. What would oil, oil be? It's a hydrocarbon. Right. So Henry Ford was a chemist saying anything you can make from a, a carbohydrate, which would be plant-based, uh, can be made into a hydrocarbon or vice versa. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it, it's really important that the viewers understand why we want to push through hemp. We want hemp for victory in 2006, so our farmers are growing it in 2007. So if they want to sit back and enjoy this tape, we can kind of go over everything that we just discussed uh, previously. Okay, then. before we watch it, uh, one, uh, Jack Herr, I think, was the one who uh, researched this because the government insisted for a long time that no, the government never, uh, because this film was out and around. Right. It was in the public domain. And, uh, and he actually tracked down the documentation exactly. that this was an official government publication. Right. Department of Archives, uh, when they were transitioning going into an electronic format for the archives, some of these things were overlooked. And you might say they were overlooked on purpose. Who knows? Um, but he did a lot of research, and Jack Hare is definitely the emperor of the West and one of the biggest advocates. Uh, he has a $100,000 challenge to prove him wrong that you can't uh, supply fuel, food, fiber for the United States without using wood and without using petroleum, right. and no one can dispute that. So, yeah, uh, kudos absolutely to Jack Hare. And for someone that wants to really read and see history, a great book by Les Stark, the hemp historian that's been on this show, Hempstone right. Heritage. And Jack Hare's book goes into the historical significance and shows the medicines that were produced in the uh, 1800s using cannabis seed and uh, shows the even the hemp for victory um, information is, is in that book. So. Okay. Well, <clears throat> let's uh, let's take a look at this video, and uh, we'll be right back. Long ago, when these ancient Grecian temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years, even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. For centuries prior to about 1850, all the ships that sailed the western seas were rigged with hemp and rope and sails. For the sailor, no less than the hangman, hemp was indispensable. A 44-gun frigate, like our cherished old Ironsides, took over 60 tons of hemp for rigging. In 
including an anchor cable 25 inches in circumference. The Conestoga wagons and prairie schooners of pioneer days were covered with hemp and canvas. Indeed, the very word canvas comes from the Arabic word for hemp. In those days, hemp was an important crop in Kentucky and Missouri. Then came cheaper imported fibers for cordage, like jute, sisal, and manila hemp, and the culture of hemp in America declined. But now, with Philippine and East Indian sources of hemp in the hands of the Japanese, and shipment of jute from India curtailed, American hemp must meet the needs of our army and navy, as well as of our industries. In 1942, patriotic farmers, at the government's request, planted 36,000 acres of seed hemp, an increase of several thousand percent. The goal for 1943 is 50,000 acres of seed hemp. In Kentucky, much of the seed hemp acreage is on river bottom land such as this, along the Kentucky River Gorge. Some of these fields are inaccessible except by boat. Thus, plans are afoot for a great expansion of the hemp industry as a part of the war program. This film is designed to tell farmers how to handle this ancient crop, now little known outside Kentucky and Wisconsin. This is hemp seed. Be careful how you use it. For to grow hemp legally, you must have a federal registration and tax stamp. This is provided for in your contract. Ask your AAA committee man or your county agent about it. Don't forget, hemp demands a rich, well-drained soil such as is found here in the bluegrass region of Kentucky or in central Wisconsin. It must be loose and rich in organic matter. Poor soils won't do. Soil that will grow good corn will usually grow hemp. Hemp is not hard on the soil. In Kentucky, it has been grown for several years on the same ground, though this practice is not recommended. A dense and shady crop, hemp tends to choke out weeds. Here's a Canada thistle that couldn't stand the competition. Dead as a dodo. Thus, hemp leaves the ground in good condition for the following crop. For fiber, hemp should be sown five pecks to the acre. With drill, the closer the rows, the better. These rows are spaced about four inches. This hemp has been broadcast. Either way, it should be sown thick enough to grow a slender stalk. Here's an ideal stand. The right height to be harvested easily, thick enough to grow slender stalks that are easy to cut and process. Stalks like these here on the left, they yield the most fiber and the best. Those on the right are too coarse and woody. For seed, hemp is planted in hills like corn, sometimes by hand. Hemp is a dioecious plant. The female flower is inconspicuous, but the male flower is easily spotted. In seed production, after the pollen has been shed, these male plants are cut out. These are the seeds on a female plant. Hemp for fiber is ready to harvest when the pollen is shedding and the leaves are falling. In Kentucky, hemp harvest comes in August. Here, the old standby has been the self-rake reaper, which has been used for a generation or more. Hemp grows so luxuriantly in Kentucky that harvesting is sometimes difficult, which may account for the popularity of the self-rake with its lateral stroke. A modified rice binder has been used to some extent. This machine works well in average hemp. Recently, the improved hemp harvester, used for many years in Wisconsin, has been introduced in Kentucky. This machine spreads the hemp in a continuous swath. It is a far cry from this fast and efficient modern harvester to the Armstrong model of yore. But here's one kind of harvester, at least, that doesn't stall in the heaviest hemp. In Kentucky, hand cutting is practiced in opening fields for the machines. In 
Kentucky, hemp is shucked as soon as safe after cutting, to be spread out for retting later in the fall. Wisconsin, hemp is harvested in September. Here, the hemp harvester with automatic spreader is standard equipment. Note how smoothly the rotating apron lays the swath preparatory to retting. Here, it is a common and essential practice to leave headlands around hemp fields. These strips may be planted to other crops, preferably small grain. Thus, the harvester has room to make its first round without preparatory hand cutting. Here, the machine is running over corn stubble. When the cutter bar is much shorter than the hemp is tall, overlapping occurs. Not so good for retting. The standard cut is eight to nine feet. The length of time hemp is left on the ground to ret depends on the weather. The swaths must be turned to get a uniform ret. When the woody core breaks away readily, like this, the hemp is about ready to take up and bind into bundles. Well retted hemp is light to dark gray. The fiber tends to pull away from the stalk. The presence of stalks in the bowstring stage indicates that retting is well underway. hemp is short or tangled, or when the ground is too wet for machines, it is bound by hand. A wooden buck is used. Twine will do for tying, but the hemp itself makes a good band. When conditions are favorable, the pickup binder is commonly used. The swaths should lie smooth and even with stalks parallel. The picker won't work well in tangled hemp. After binding, hemp is shocked as soon as possible to stop further retting. In 1942, 14,000 acres of fiber hemp were harvested in the United States. The goal for 1943 is 300,000 acres. Thus, hemp, cannabis sativa, the old standby cordage fiber, is staging a strong comeback. This is Kentucky hemp going into the dryer of a mill at Versailles. In the old days, breaking was done by hand, one of the hardest jobs known to man. Now the power breaker makes quick work of it. Spinning American hemp into rope yarn or twine in the old Kentucky River Mill at Frankfort, Kentucky. Another pioneer plant that has been making cordage for more than a century. Such plants will presently be turning out products spun from American-grown hemp. Twine of various kinds for tying, winding armatures, and upholsterers work. Rope for marine rigging and towing, for hay forks, derricks, and heavy-duty tackle. Light-duty fire hose. Thread for shoes for millions of American soldiers. 
and parachute webbing for our paratroopers. As for the United States Navy, every battleship requires 34,000 feet of rope and other craft accordingly. So here in the Boston Navy Yard, where cables for frigates were made long ago, crews are now working night and day making cordage for the fleet. In the old days, rope yarn was spun by hand. Today, even the rope walk is mechanized. 160 fathoms to go. The rope yarn feeds through holes in an iron plate. This is manila hemp from the Navy's rapidly dwindling reserve. When that is gone, American hemp will go on duty again. Hemp for mooring ships. Hemp for tow lines. Hemp for tackle and gear. Hemp for countless naval uses, both on ship and shore. Just as in the days when old Ironside sailed the seas victorious, with her hempen shrouds and hempen sails. Hemp for victory. Okay, there you go. Um, I I was thinking of saying I should have uh, told people beforehand. Every time they say hemp for this and hemp for that. Imagine them saying marijuana for this and marijuana for that because that's what they mean, even though that's a racist term, but in the context of what it would sound like today, that's what they mean, right? Well, I mean, I really, I mean, legally, that's the way they're approaching it. Mean, the people that are anti-hemp and anti-cannabis and they're pro, they're, because they're concerned with marijuana, absolutely. They could take that film and say, marijuana for victory and the people that have all the information for helping sick people because there is a great use for medicinal cannabis or recreational cannabis um, again that aspect of the plant there's so much potential for healing but the the the, adv the proponents would say marijuana for victory and marijuana this and that right. and well, I'm just saying in terms of people's consciousness what the what the substance is to most people right uh, and it's uh, I just want to juxtapose the fact that that sounds outrageous when you think about it but yet this is the government producing a video saying that this substance is positive for all these reasons that they just you right. know illustrated there and and they showed some great pictures because when you're talking about hemp farming and there's always an issue well federal law enforcement wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two and we have to remember our our national peers are are the Canadians the Germans the French their law enforcement has no issue with distinguishing between medicinal rec medicinal and recreational cannabis versus commercial industrial hemp and that's always a bugaboo here but when you're looking at uh, commercial industrial hemp like they showed in the film you're talking 150 to 300 plants per meter, and you're looking at a plant that's mainly grown for its stalk and its seed, grows very tight. If it was medicinal or recreational cannabis, it would be two plants per meter. It would look more like a Christmas tree. It would be harvested for that flowering part of the plant. Even the film that the viewers saw earlier was showing real tall, thin plants. It looked like flax. It looked like bamboo jute or sisal. Mm -hmm. So... I uh, don't want to cut you short, but no, I know we right. want to kind of recap here uh, before we run out of time. So, Well, we need uh, to remember that anything you can make from petroleum, you can make from the farmer's fields. If folks are truly interested in having hemp grown as, as we did 
prior to all this issue with marijuana, they need to contact their local congress person, an elected representative. They need them to support H.R. 3037 by Dr. Ron Paul, an elected congressman who te from Texas, who has put a resolution forth that says hemp is not marijuana. It will bring hemp farming back to the Pennsylvania farmers for 2007. My company, producing nutritious hemp foods, will contract with these Pennsylvania farmers for that production because that's what we're working for. We want to help the farmer, we want to uh, help the environment, and we want to help the consumer. And we can create a win-win situation by bringing hemp back into this issue. So anything you can make from petroleum, you can make from that farmer's fields. You have a rich seed source for protein, vitamins, and minerals right from the, 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 the uh, land and, and locally from here. And there's a lot of history in Pennsylvania, and people just need to come to Hempfield Township to see all the names that are associated with Hempfield Township. This is not Marijuana Township, it's Hempfield Township. Right. So a lot of potential. And if people want to um, know more, obviously we'll put your website uh, up, but uh, they can also uh, probably see you and uh, uh, people working with you at the York Fair. York Fair, uh, Pennsylvania uh, Farm Show. This, uh, this fall in 2006. And um, uh, you'll be located uh, in the political row right political at the entrance to, uh, to Old Main, I think yep. that, that that is. And um, you'll be... Uh, uh, available and uh, and uh, there to educate people as as well as uh, yeah about everything. Definitely come to the website. Our number is one eight hundred use hemp. Preferably, if you're local, call our local number. But that that's our our opportunity. Right. So well, I, thanks for having me on, Mike. Okay, I really well, I, really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming, Sean. Bring us uh, up to date, and uh, I'm sure you'll be back again uh, for another update as uh, time as it evolves. Yep. Right. Right. So. Uh, the one thing I would like to remind you is that uh, if you don't give freedom to others, you do not deserve it for yourself. And on that note, Six Semper Tornadoes.